saying for new people, um, or maybe you're just joining, why is this so zoomed in on me? Um, sorry about my pores. Um, but every Thursday we've been having um, mainly Lori Metz, LCSW, who has created this initiative. And um, well, with you, with your help. So thank you. Well, and Camille, shout out to Camille, yes, who's not here Camille. today. Um, but we've been having like third party Thursdays, um, <laughs> which actually sounds really fun. Um, third party reproduction Thursdays. And as I said at the very beginning, before um, my esteemed panelists joined, my God, sorry, my camera's doing the weirdest thing. Our goal is to improve health outcomes and normalize third party reproduction by requesting that these options are added to medical intake forms under family history. And there's a petition right now, it's on change.org, um, and it's called exactly that, normalizing third party reproduction. Right now we have 161 people who have signed, um, but we would love it if you would sign. And as I was saying again before um, these lovely women joined, this impacts more people than you maybe realize. And just to share some quick statistics, and then um, we're gonna start with some questions. Uh, according to, the, to data from Society for Assi Assisted Reproductive Technology and the Human Reproduction Journal, approximately 3,452 women use frozen donor eggs each year. Doesn't necessarily always achieve a live birth, but that's the stat. Then approximately 2,413 use fresh donor eggs, so frozen and fresh. And then sperm donation, the numbers range from 30 to 60,000 per year. And- Which is huge. Terms of a, oh yes, these are big and numbers. It's and, and, it's yeah, it's huge, huge. And that's what I'm hoping people will realize whether they're joining today because they've dealt with infertility or not, there's somebody they know who has pursued this as a, a family building option. Um, in terms of adoption, in 2017, over 25,000 donor eggs and embryos were used. Um, excuse me, that's, that's donor eggs and embryos, not adoption. 2% of our population is raised through adoption. Sorry, it's a lot of numbers, and I hate math. However, the point is, that's a lot of people. Lot um, of people. There are many paths to parenthood, and this initiative is to support them all. And we hope that adding these options to the medical intake form will not only help normalize this necessary option for many to build their families, but it'll actually improve medical outcomes because you're then asking this information up front and the doctor will hopefully have all of the medical history of um, the child, individual, whatever age they are, um, that is relevant to their healthcare. So um, that's basically the Reader's Digest version of what we're doing. Um, and I'm here today joined by, again, Lori Metz, who kind of has been heading this up. Um, she's a therapist. Um, she has a podcast called Life. And um, it delves into all aspects of one's life, literally. Um, and she is a huge champion of third-party reproduction, um, the patients exploring this as an option, and kind of the emotional roller coaster that goes along with it uh, and the stress of it. And then, of course, Risa Levine, uh, who's, yes, who's fabulously famous. <laughs> and one in our place. Fertility famous, as my friend Candace and I call it. Um, she's a very well-known, respected infertility advocate. She also has been very transparent about her infertility journey. She is a personal shero of mine, um, not only just for her I brain and her beauty. Likewise. I, I would love to have your hair color. That's my next thing. <laughs> I want to keep getting that. lighter. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do the Stepford Wives thing here in the suburbs. Um, but... Let me start by asking Lori, um, can you describe the third party reproduction uh, journey for patients in general and why it can be both emotional and stressful? Oh, absolutely, thanks. And Jay, thank you for everything that you're, you're doing. Oh, sure. I work with this, and Risa, I am so excited that you're on. I'm always excited whenever I see you, honestly. Yeah. So thank you, because you really are able to help people understand what it's like to know how to start advocating 
on an individual level, and that's so empowering. So thank you. But the reason why I, I wanted to start this is because it just evolved through conversations I've been having with people I work with. And Camille Gandhi has been incredible. I adore her, and I've gotten to know her through this. And um, some of you may know her from The Rookie or from her acting career. And she has been a huge advocate because she is a donor egg mom. She has a baby through donor egg. And um, I want to say that correctly. And I reached out to her because what we want to do is we want to normalize this process. And I thought we're better to normalize it than through the medical record. When I work with people, what I have found is that when somebody is conceived through third-party reproduction, whether it's donor egg, donor sperm, donor embryo, there's a lot of feelings attached to that journey. And, and many times, uh, for a multitude of reasons, it's not necessarily um, provided to a healthcare provider, and the healthcare provider doesn't ask the question. So now we have an, a situation where we're taking family histories on people, and they'll ask for information on a mother, a father, a sibling, and then they'll write other. And the word other kind of breaks my heart because they also do this on college applications. They do it on a multitude of things. And maybe because I've worked in healthcare for over 20, 30 years at this point, and I've worked on the development of electronic medical records, I know that that's a great starting ground. So if we could get the conversation going, if we could put donor and adoption on these on these forms, not only will it give an improved information healthcare wise to the provider who is treating that, that person, but it'll also allow the person to know that there's a place for them to put the information that they want. Now, last week's Dr. Serena Chin was chatting with Camille and I, and she actually said that if somebody is conceived through a donor, you would also want the parent, if the mother is carrying the, um, the fetus and it's a donor egg, you would also want the mom who's carrying and raising a child to put her information on it because of epigenetics. It was a very interesting conversation. Oh, and, yeah. And so that was, that was, I think, gives me the chills just repeating it, honestly, not to be over dramatic, but it does. So what we want to do is we want to start the conversation. We want everybody to feel good. I've heard conversations with people in their 50s that forget to mention it. I've heard moms with children who have conditions, they bring the children to the hospital. The children are five, six, 10 years old, or they bring them to their doctor and they've never shared this information. It's a gap of information. And also what it shows is that the person is still trying to process their fertility journey. And we want to help them through this. We want to help them to feel that what they've gone through in every conception is normal. There is no abnormal way of conceiving a baby. There are different ways of conceiving a baby. And we want that, that child that was conceived through third-party reproduction or raised through adoption to feel like there's a place for them to put their information. The other residual of this is that, you know, Jay, when you, Arisu and I, Arisu and you, or when I go and we fill out these forms, we're going to see the word donor and adoption on these forms. And that's going to start to resonate with us as another way to, you know, to be born or to be raised. So I know it's a little bit of a long-winded answer, but it's an emotional roller coaster and it's a tugging in the heart that I think never really stops 100%, but we can help. And the way we can help is by talking about it. And the way we force the conversation is by putting it on a medical form to start the conversation where it all started, which is in the medical field. Right. It's, it definitely seems like it's twofold. It's not only just normalizing the experience for the patient, but then actually genuinely making sure you're delivering the best medical care. Absolutely. Because sometimes, you know, we'll go down a path and say, well, is this genetic? Who's, who's had this? Where is the DNA? Where is the genetics? Where is it coming from? And right. so why go down a path if we don't necessarily have that information? And many times when we're working with donor conception, whether it's, you know, the sperm, the egg, or the embryo, we only have information for this person who is probably relatively young. Right? Right. We don't have a gamut of information. So it's a good starting point for people. And, and Risa, let me ask you, because it's funny, I think sometimes people don't even know how to begin to advocate, <laughs> like in general. And it is sort of a unique and interesting skill because, I don't know, you hear the word advocate and you think of a lot of different things. Yeah. But um, 
in your experience, because in, in case people don't know, RISA truly has impacted change in um, legislation and even just changing minds. Um, so when it comes to patients dealing with infertility or even same-sex couples who have built their family through third-party reproduction or adoption, when you think of advocating for not only themselves, but their child's health care, what avenues do you think of? Do you think immediately lawmakers? Do you think doctors? Do you think family? Do you think all three? Can, can I just ask one more question, Risa? Could you, could you help people understand what advocating is? Yes, and that's you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just because advocating is <laughs> out there, like, you know, with the right. Thank you. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of levels to the, to the questions that you've asked me and a lot of levels to the discussion that we need to have around this concept to empower people to feel that the choices they've made in their personal life are important in a, in a global world. Yeah. Um, so first, I want to frame this conversation by telling a little story um, that happened about eight or nine years ago. I was dating this very awful person. Um, however, he was a dad of two children, one of whom was um, the product of an IVF cycle. The, the sister of that, the, the son was born through IVF, the sister was born um, through normal, through, I wanted to say, regular conception. And for a school project, she decided to tell her brother's story about IVF. And she did an entire project on IVF and described what it is. And she was 11-ish or so, old enough to know how babies were born, but also to understand how her brother was conceived. And so she created this project for her school and the school principal called the parents um, and told them that although the child had done a phenomenal job, um, she was not going, and she was getting an A on the project, uh, she was not gonna be allowed to present because the topic was too sensitive and too uncomfortable and oh. too inappropriate for 11 year olds to hear in their school class. OMG. What does that do to children who are conceived this way? You basically mm -hmm. annihilated their whole birth story. Uh -huh. um, and, and, and what you're trying to do is one step in changing that horrible thing that happens to children who are told that their, their, their birth story is invalid. Um, so this is a very important, I mean, and that was already eight or nine years ago, and we still haven't seen as much progress as we are now seeing. We're still not seeing enough. Right. Um, so not only do the parents, you know, for, for medical reasons need to be able to do this, but also for a sense of self. I mean, we're, we're finally having a conversation about mental health in the context of everything. Imagine the mental health aspects um, for children and parents who feel that the way that they've brought their children and that the way they've come into the world are, are, are not deserving of anything more than other. So you, when you ask me what advocating means, it means just that, feeling that you have a sense of, of self in the universe and that you're entitled and deserve that sense of self and announcing to the yes. world that that's important, that you matter, that your story matters, that who you are matters, that, that, the, that your needs matter. Um, so that's step one in advocating. Now what do you do with it? Yeah. Okay, so you ask, where do you go? And the question is, is who can change? Who can, who can impact that you matter? So when you say, should it be legislators? Should it be physicians? Should it be medical records? Should it be hospitals? Should it be schools? Should be jobs? Yes. The answer is yes. Um, <laughs> so, yes. Now, um, you're not going to like the next thing I'm going to say because um, it, it undermines the method that you've chosen, but, the, but I would be lying or I'd be denying something that I have been saying for the last 15 years. I do not like petitions. I think <laughs> petitions are the, I think that they are the easiest and least um, investment that somebody who wants to advocate can do to effectuate change. 
on both sides, on the signatory to a petition and on the, and on the, on the, on the audience for a petition. Somebody who says they want to advocate signs a petition and then somebody wants them to do something else. They're like, well, I signed the petition. Right. Okay. It's you like, don't want to get like get out of advocacy free jail card. That's exactly <laughs> it. It's a little it's a little orange monopoly card. To get out of get out of jail. You know, get out of advocacy free card. Yeah. Um, no, you signed a petition. That's barely even a step. And then the question is, is what are you doing with this petition? My personal belief is is that the organizations or the politicians or the um, the you know not for profits or the or for the for profits who say that they're taking a survey or, or a petition are merely collecting signatures. They're merely collecting your information. They're merely collecting demographic or financial information. And that is not enough. So that's problem number one. It's, um, you know, you're giving out your information without actually doing anything. And the problem number two is, is who's seeing this petition? What do you plan to do with it? Like I said, for many organizations, they're simply collecting information and, um, and then, and then hitting you up for money. Um, I know, Lori, that you are not doing that. But then, <laughs> what's the plan with this information? You don't have you had you haven't decided on a determined audience. Well, um, we, yeah, well, we do, we do, we do have a determined audience. And actually, um, I can't take credit for sole credit for the petition. It was put out there for a couple of reasons, and I really appreciate and respect everything you just said. And I'm hoping that maybe, maybe, maybe some of the people who signed it will do a little bit more involvement, at least grassroots, when they start to talk to people, and it will open up their minds to the situation. So right. that's what I'm hoping. Um, but Camille and I had spoken about it, and Jay, and um, the purpose behind it was to get the conversation going, to get people interested in talking. The goal of where to present it was going to be to the AMA. Okay, so that's that where I was going. Yeah, that's really where it's going, I, I, because I otherwise, I don't think it, it would have weight anywhere else. Right. I would there. rather than a petition, my preferred first step would have been. And again, you know, I mean, I apologize. I was brought into this and, you know, you already have it going. Yeah, I feel my, bad. I should have consulted with you first. Um, my preferred <laughs> first step <laughs> would have oh been a campaign <laughs> would be, you know, where people actually, you know, where you would create a template, but you would create the opportunity for people to add in a little bit of their own story so that it, 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 you know, the organizations like the AMA, they know what the emotional and, and physical effort is to sign a petition, um, which is basically nothing um, for, for, for the person signing the, the petition. But rather, the effort that it takes to write a letter and to add in your own story, saying, I have two kids through adoption, I have one kid through donor conception, you know, et cetera, um, actually puts a story to the signature and has more impact. And I, I do believe that there's so much value to storytelling. Um, right. and, and that's, the, I hope that the people who have signed the petition will then take the next step of actually telling their story on some level. Um, so, you know, the, EM, the AMA is certainly one, audi one intended audience for this. The electronic medical records companies is impo it's important for them to know that their records should be designed. Um, you know, I mean, they're for-profit businesses, but they should you know that, that there, there's value, and there's medical value in that. And, and so, um, the the subgroups, you know, the the you know the pediatric yeah. groups, you know, the the you know all of the all, yeah. all of the Lisa, you know, I started the first e-prescribing project in the state of New York. So I had kind of the privilege of starting that program, which was the basis of the electronic medical record and presenting it, presenting the findings. And what was really interesting is, and what I think happened, not to shortchange anything is, they developed templates and they asked the people whose departments it are, what do you want in the template? And I think through the electronic medical record, it's an easy win to add these two indices to it because those fields should be relatively flexible in order to do it. I think it's something that people didn't think about. That's, yeah. that's truly my thought on this. And so if we can get enough thought and spotlight on it, maybe, maybe people will add those two indices there that could start that conversation. And the other pieces, I was thinking if we could get the regulatory bodies involved, 
and the patient safety oversight bodies involved to say, hey, you should be doing this. Well, now we have a full support system there, kind of forcing the healthcare system to talk about it. And in turn, maybe the school systems and everybody else who asks this information. So that's that. So the you know, so state legislatures and you know, the health departments of, of the 50 states in the country, and of course, the education de departments of, of the 50 states in the country. Because yes, these, again, I go back to this story. These questions are very important. Kids go to school and they get the genealogy assignment or they get the, you know, family tree assignments. And that's the first time that they may discover um, their donor conception or even worse when they're 10 years old and they have an accident and they need, a, you know, something yeah. um, and, these, and they discover it for the first time. That's not fair. This no. all should be normalized um, yeah. in, on all these levels. And, it's so um, hard. I'm sorry. Okay. It's so hard. And that these stories are the stories that, that incited me to do this to reach right. out and try and start this, the exact series. I'm working with people from the religious community right now who don't want to kind of share their stories with their children and they struggle with it because they're afraid that the, the community that they live in will not accept it. I'm working with people now whose children are adopted, going to college, and they have to fill out college application forms and they don't have that family history and they're checking off other. And why have to lament over that now when you're going through a college application, why not just be able to have a place to put it? So that emotional impact is, is significant in all these levels that you're talking about. So thank you. It's actually, it's so fascinating because I think like, I, I, I'm not one to use sports metaphors, um, mainly because I, I don't care for sports, but there's one on in hockey that I feel like applies here and that's all shots on goal. And I feel like, if we start with this petition, if nothing else, it's a it's a mailing list or a list of people that that's, we know. That's, what I, that's yes, that's yeah, what, that we that's that care it. about this issue, and we can update them, create templates um, that they can use in their own um, what's the word county your your own to speak to your own lawmakers in your particular area. But I but I think it's so fascinating just listening to you guys talk because I'm reminded when it comes to advocating for yourself for whatever issue, you really do have to be persistent in every avenue you pursue. So whether you do sign a petition, you then, why not write your own letter to the AMA? Why not share the petition online and say why it's important to you. Not so much maybe the emphasis on the petition, but you're sharing with people why it's important to you that you rethink this. And something Laurie said in a previous um, Third Party Thursday is when you're at the doctor's, like at your own doctor's office, there's nothing stopping them from perhaps adding the form or sorry, adding the question to their form. You know, why not ask your own doctor? Have you guys thought about doing this? So, um, I think it's a really valid point. And I think if we really do want to invoke change, it just takes a level of, again, commitment and persistence. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and again, the, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, in my legal practice, you, one of the things that I learned as a junior associate is the explanation when you're negotiating a document, somebody wants to take something out, the explanation that many young lawyers give is, well, it's in the form. I can't take it out. Um, I have negotiated against against people who have a residential provision in their commercial form or a shopping center provision in their office lease form, and they don't apply. And I'll get this resistance. It's in the form. The forms are just a bunch of words on paper. They can be changed. Yes, right. This idea that a form is, is something carved in you know, hieroglyphics on you know, the Rosetta Stone or something like that is just, it's really, it really has never been easier to change a form that, that clinics and physicians offices use. And that's the message that has to be given. And this should be taught. I mean, I want to say at the, at the fertility clinics, however, as the victim of signing a form that was not particularly thought out of for right. for somebody who then would go eventually go through a divorce it really does take patient advocacy and so this this idea um 
that Lori has, has spoken about and developed and is advocating for must be brought to the patient community because only when a patient community demands change for something that's going to affect them, that's when it happens. Um, so yes, we can, we can go to interested parties and state legislatures, et cetera, but unless there is a groundswell of support for it, it won't happen. Um, and you know, we said the interesting thing is this is such a sensitive topic and there's so much privacy around it that most people don't want to step forward. And that's what I love so much about the work that Camille is doing. She's trying to take that, that secret away and she's trying to put it out there saying, I have this gorgeous child who I wouldn't change for anything in the world. And look at us, we're great, we're good. I work with people who have donor, you know, children conceived through donor egg and donor sperm, and they wouldn't change these children for the world. And the children are biologically connected, and sometimes there's two or three of them, but they don't necessarily want to tell the world. And so by keeping they, it private. Yes, but the one beauty of all of our HIPAA laws is that you don't have to tell the world. And it's one of the reasons why I don't like petitions, because I think it would be easy, one of the many, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I really You're killing like our petition. I'm sorry, but I, I mean, it is on record in many places that Risa Levine hates petitions. Um, but, but, but the beauty of the storytelling to, the, to your own doctor is, is that that is protected by privacy laws. Yeah. And, um, you know, that all, of, all of this is protected, and this is the best way to advocate, is to start with your own doctor. Yes and say, wait guys, I need this to be in my medical records. I need this for the protection of myself and for my children and for our own family's health, that this be in our records. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to necessarily tell the world, but I want you to have it. And I want it to be captured in a place where God forbid my kid gets into an accident, they have the, or God forbid my kid gets sick and I'm not there to you know, fight for them. This information is available. Right. I think this is great. I think it's really good information, Risa. So we, we do have the petition, but for those of you who sign it, we are going to recontact you. <laughs> and we're going to follow and, up with you and, and ask you for next steps. So, next steps. But what the but other you know thing, what, too, Lori? This is interesting. I'm sorry. No. The other interesting piece is that I had sent this petition to people who have no clue about fertility, and it has started the conversation going. So I know that that won't go far, but... I love the fact that the conversation could get out there to people not in the fertility world, because that will also help, I think. What I was going to say, though, Lori, is it so I I went through infertility. Um, you've talked to pe people at Resolve. You've talked to all these people. And when you suggested this, a light bulb went off and they're like, oh, my God, I never thought of it. So I think if nothing else, um, like you said, it starts the conversation, but maybe it also gives people the idea like, oh, I never even thought mm -hmm. of asking my doctor to add it to the form. Or I never thought, hey, it should be on the form. So I, I again, I stand by all shots on goal. However, <laughs> as a very active advocate myself, you absolutely have to back it up with action. I, I mean, I think this is yeah. such a valuable point and a great conversation because we are trying to inspire people to speak up for themselves and to normalize their own journey. Um, and so it's, it's just a great topic. So I really thank you both. Um, in our last minute, do you have any closing thoughts, feelings, statements? Risa. Never be shy about telling a physician what it is you need, um, no matter how much they try to cut you off and tell you that they're out of time or talk over you. Never, ever, ever be shy about telling a physician exactly what it is you need. And then when you, you know, when you realize how important that is, equally, never be shy about telling your legislature, you know, at every level, at your local and state and federal levels, um, what it is you need, because nobody's a mind reader. Um, and they don't know there's a problem unless you tell them. So the whole, why don't they fix it? is why don't you fix it? Get rid of the they. The they is you. Oh, I love that. I want to embroider that on a pillow. <laughs> I think that's great. And I think the only thing I would say from my perspective is that, you know, we're all brought into this world to not to sound too cliche, but to live our best life and to try and be happy and comfortable and secure in our own skin. And this is just another effort to help that. 
and you could be a year old, a month, you know, a month old, a year old, 10 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old. If this was your journey, it's something to embrace and feel good about. So speaking up for it, advocating, whichever word you like to use, but letting people know who you are and feeling good about it, I, I think is profound. And Risa has given us so much good information today. So thank you, Risa. And thank you, Jay, as always. Yes. Yes. No. And, and, and also just another little shout out to Camille, who usually is yes. on um, these IG lives. She really, I, I, I said this to her before, I'm sure she's sick of it, but particularly that she's a celebrity and has been so transparent and positive and empowering i really i appreciate it so much um because it it does um i think make people who are considering this as an option or need this as an option it, it's helpful to them to see oh well so and so did this and to go and look at their profile and see their journey and it, it's it's just been so positive so yay camille wherever you are um, she's okay. She's out of fitting right now. Yeah, she's out of fitting. <laughs> she's out of fitting. Then those show. actresses doing stuff. <laughs> she's a love. She is really absolutely a fabulous love. She, yes. Yeah. So um, stay tuned, um, particularly to Lori's social media, which is at Lori.mm, as in um, Mary Mary. Um, and she is, again, particularly leading the charge here. And so if this is something that speaks to you, I would definitely, if you're not following her, follow her uh, to keep track on this. And there have been so many people also that contacted they couldn't make today's live, but they're gonna be watching the video. So if you're watching the video, I'll put in the comments um, additional information that you can do to advocate and uh, to contact Risa or Lori or me um, to help make this initiative successful. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you, I believe, next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lori. Lori. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Risa. Thank you so much for joining today. And thank you, as always, Jack. Bye.